uh, our uh, third lecturer um, for tonight is Dr. Ahmed Taha. He's a professor of anesthesia at Ain Shams University in Cairo. Uh, his lecture is, is going to be uh, on brachial plexus block. Welcome, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, I'm very happy to to give this lecture after Dr. Samir and Dr. Walid. Very nice lecture, really. Uh, just a second. Bismillah uh, rahim Today, inshallah, we'll talk about the uh, precaplexus, which block I should perform. Uh, uh, my objective is the first, we'll start uh, talking about the, some anatomy of precaplexus. We will discuss uh, different kinds of the precaplexus block as the advantages of each uh, approach and the drawbacks of them. And then we'll go for innervation and peripheral block for each region, for the clavicle, for shoulder, for arm and elbow, for forearm, and for the hand. And at the end of the any question. Uh, in the upper limb, thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that in, uh, uh, the upper limb is supplied by one plexus, not like lower limb, which is supplied by two plexus. So single injection is enough to provide anesthesia to the patient. This plexus, of course, is a plexus. plexus. Uh, thanks Allah also that's brachial plexus, superficial plexus. So usually all upper limb blocks are simple and easy and less disc causes less discomfort to the patient. Uh, for simplification, the brachial plexus starts by five roots and then roots change into trunks where you give the interscleen block, then trunks giving divisions, then divisions go to the brachial plexus cord and from cord most of branches is gone. Uh, branch it from the level of the cords. As you see in this picture here, that's most of for uh, brachial plexus branches, about 14 branch coming out of the after distal to the cord level. However, there is one important branch coming from the uh, upper trunk, which is a suprascapular nerve, which supply the shoot. So all branches, of, all most of the important branches coming from brachial plexus coming after the cord, with exception of one important one is suprascapular nerve, which comes from the upper trunk. Now we are going to speak about some uh, the uh, precaplexus techniques, uh, blocks, and their drawbacks and advantages. The first one is interscaline block. It's one of the very simple block and very successful block as well. Where you block the trunks of precaplexus, as you see here, this is the precaplexus between the scalene muscle. And here's the sonographic appearance. You block this brachial plexus, and this is interscaline, a very successful and very uh, simple block. Uh, it's one of the advantages of, of interscaline that is look and say spread to superficial cervical plexus, which is giving innervation to the skin of the upper shoulder uh, and the clavicle as well. So in surgeries in these regions, uh, this will be an advantage for interscaline to do this spread. However, it also spread to the sympathetic fibers and causes stosis and Horner syndrome, and maybe to the current range of nerve causing some change in the sound. However, it doesn't care, yani it just reassures the patient, it's not a big issue. The main issue with the is the phrenic block. Uh, the phrenic block is uh, very close, uh, uh, its relation to the breakup, this is very close at this level. So uh, the breakup, uh, interscaline block result in phrenic block, and this results in mild hypoxia, which is can be simply tolerated in uh, most of patients. Uh, as we see here, this is the M mode uh, picture I showed yesterday to differentiate between pneumothorax and uh, uh, diaphragmatic uh, block. Uh, if you have a pneumothorax, you don't have this uh, uh, dot-like uh, uh, appearance of the M mode. Uh, you just have lines. This meaning that uh, two players of pleura is separated. Uh, the phrenic nerve occurs in almost 100% of interscaline block. And in our last study we published in ACTA, we find that even with 5 ml, the uh, interscaline block results in phrenic nerve block in about 90 or more than 90% of patients. So as I said, it can be tolerated in most of patients, except in patients with uh, limited respiratory function. These people will not tolerate such uh, diaphragmatic block. Another problem with interscaline is uh, the vertebral artery. That's if you give the interscaline at level of the C7, usually the vertebral artery at this level is still not inside the transverse foramen. And so if a deep or very medial or very deep advance from the needle uh, injection in the, inside the vertebral artery may go to the brain and causing convulsion. 
So this is, uh, so as I said, the enterskinin is very safe with the exception in the patient of the uh, limited respiratory function. The second block here is a supraclavicular block, uh, what is uh, very famous as the spinal of the upper limb, uh, where that uh, division of brachial plexus is surrounding the brachial artery, uh, the subclavian artery. And I'm sorry by mistake yesterday, I mentioned that this bone is the clavicle. Uh, accurately, this bone is the first strip. I'm sorry for this mistake I, I mentioned yesterday. So uh, this block uh, is a very successful also block and the brachial plexus is very superficial, so technically it is easy. However, it have a big problem that is the lung is very, very, and the pleura is very close to the brachial plexus. And incidence of the uh, pleural injury, it's maybe go to 10% in nervous stimulator landmark technique and it's still happening even with uh, ultrasound. And at the same time, this block is also spread to the phrenic nerve so it does not give me a big advantage over interscaline block. The next one is the costoclavicular block. It's a new block and know a lot of data about this block. It's midway between the supraclavicular and infraclavicular. As you see that just the subclavian artery here in the supraclavicular, it's, uh, the name is changed into axillary and it's still the plexus plex lying lateral to the vessel, but the probe is placed below the clavicle. No data about this block, and actually I don't use it a lot, so I don't have uh, an opinion about this block, but it seems to me midway between the supraclavicular and infraclavicular. Now we are going for infraclavicular block. In the infraclavicular block, we the block the brachial plexus cord around cords around the second part of axillary. This is the axillary artery, and this is the cephalic part, and this is the caudal. And you can find this is a lateral cord, a posterior cord, a medial cord, and this is axillary vein. In this situation, the artery lie bit, uh, deep to the two pectoralis muscle. Uh, relative to the interscaline block, the infraclavicular uh, does not block the phrenic in almost all cases, and but it also does not block the suprascapular nerve. So alone, it cannot be used for shoulder surgery. Relative to the axillary block, the infraclavicular has less needle pass. So actually it causes less discomfort to the patient than the axillary block. It also blocks the axillary nerve. So this nerve is not blocked in the axillary block. So this is a very funny. That axillary block does not block the axillary nerve. But this block, the infraclavicular block has one disadvantage that is uh, the onset is delayed. Yani it's not that fast onset. And so in this block, I prefer to use a higher concentration of local anesthetic or add some short uh, intermediate acting like lidocaine. Also relatively, this is one of the deepest position of the precaplex. So it is relatively deep than other precaplexes in the intrascaline or supraclavicular or axillary. All of this situation, the precaplex is more superficial than uh, this situation in the infraclavicular. Uh, the infraclavicular, the needle access to the brachial plexus may be inserted uh, inferior to the, this is the CT of the clavicle. Uh, this is a two pectoral muscle, and this is a vessel, the axillary vessel, and surrounded by brachial plexus here. And this is a clavicle. In the classic approach, the needle is inserted b uh, bis, uh, uh, inferior to the clavicle. Uh, in the retro or posterior approach, the needle is inserted superior to the clavicle. And this kind of needle insertion superior to the clavicle and this technique make the needle is more or less more horizontal. And as we described yesterday, the more is horizontal the needle, the better is visualization. So actually in this retroclavicular approach, the needle visualization is better than the classic approach. Then the injection point. In the infraclavicular, it's a very famous study done by pioneers of regional anesthesia that is they inject 40 ml of local anesthetic deep to the artery, what is known as double bubble sign. However, if you use less than this volume, the word block is not working. Instead, in uh, our technique and our uh, routine work, we inject just 10 ml of local anesthetic above the artery and 10 below the artery, and that's it. So we inject 20 ml only. So as you see, this is the local anesthetic surrounding the artery from above and from below, and this is the needle very clear. You will not achieve this clear needle in the classic approach. 
as we said that is infraclavicular cannot block the the uh, shoulder because uh, lack of uh, suprascapular nerve block so if you add suprascapular nerve block you can use it for shoulder uh, and this uh, we publish this uh, technique called the iso block that is combined we can combine both suprascapular block and infraclavicular block through one injection or one single puncture above the clavicle here and we use the sub technique that i showed you yesterday for blocking the suprascapular nerve then we'll go to the another technique for plexus with axillary nerve it's very easy technique that's the surrounding the plexus branches of plexus the median ulnar and, and radial surrounding the axillary artery with the muscle cutaneous uh, nearby without, uh, within the cracobrachialis muscle uh, the axillary nerve as i told axillary block as i told it does not block the axillary nerve it still also need a long uh, duration uh, so its onset is really is delayed uh, last uh, technique, or uh, lastly, the technique of the elbow block, where you block separate these branches of preca plexus separately. Uh, we have three branches crossing the elbow, the median ulna and radial, and some cutaneous branches, which is the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, and posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Uh, the posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm is the branch of radial. And the lateral cutaneous nerve forearm is the branch of muscle cutaneous, while the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm is a branch of the medial cord. In this image that you can see, this is a technique of median nerve block at the elbow, the nerve like uh, media to the plica plexus. And here the ulnar nerve block, the nerve lies superficial to the uh, medial supracondylar ridge. And then the radial nerve, it's the nerve lie anterior and superficial spot diagnosis in front of the humerus. Now we didn't solve the problem, which, uh, which block I should perform. The choice of, uh, of the block that you should perform is depend first on the regional site of the surgery, uh, the regional innervation of this site regarding the skin innervation, the muscle innervation, and the bone innervation. Because if the surgery is deep to the bone and uh, in most of orthopedic, sur uh, the orthopedic surgery, so the bone also should be blocked adequately if you use it as an CZ. The second thing that affect my choice of uh, a block is the uh, patient comorbidity versus the block risk. So if the patient have bleeding tendency, I will not prefer to give, for example, infraclavicular block. If the patient have COPD or COPD or uh, a limited respiratory function or ischemic heart disease, I will not prefer to give intraskeletal block. So the patient morbidity and the block risk is the second point. Then if the patient is healthy, and we may find that many blocks can cover same area. In this situation, I will my choice will depend on the simplicity of the technique and the block criteria. The more rapid onset, the more prolonged analgesic effect, and the less motor block postoperatively will be my first choice. We will go region by region to see the innovation and what is, to my belief, the best technique or the technique of choice in each region. First, we'll go to the clavicle. The clavicle, the bone of clavicle is supplied by two branches of the upper trunk, the suprascapular nerve and subclavius nerve, and both are branches of the upper trunk. While the skin overlying the clavicle is from superficial cervical plexus. As we said, that is interscaline block can spread to this superficial cervical plexus, and it will block the upper trunk, so it can be used for anesthesia for ORF or clavicle. For analgesia, uh, Interscaline block can be also used. Uh, superficial cervical block will, blo will block the soft tissue above the clavicle, the skin, and subcutaneous tissue, and it will give a very good analgesia, really. And it may be also replaced by infiltration of local anesthetic uh, above the clavicle. However, in superficial cervical plexus, in clinical part, it reduces phrenic nerve block as well. So it will not give you advantage over interscaline block. Both of them will block the phrenic block. Uh, with exception that is interscaline will keep the shoulder moving. So the patient can move the shoulder after surgery. This as analgesia, but for anesthesia, no other alternative than interscaline block. The second is the shoulder surgery. In the shoulder, it's supplied by many branches of the brachial plexus cords. 
So if you give infraclavicular block, you'll block about 70 or 80% of the shoulder. But still there is one branch, as I said, it's the suprascapular nerve, which is not branch of the cord. It's coming from the upper trunk. So, and also there is, uh, the, as you see the shoulder here, the skin may is inflated by superficial cervical plexus. So the first choice of anesthetic or analgesic is intraskeline block. However, as you said, I will not prefer intraskeline block if the patient have resp limited respiratory function. In this case, I will use isoblock, which is combined uh, uh, suprascapular block and infraclavicular block. And this will not block the skin, so I will add some local infiltration of the skin at the skin points. As uh, you see this video, this isoblock is used alone as an aesthetic agent for a patient for shoulder surgery. And this, as you see, that's been free uh, intro introduction of the uh, scope and patient uh, is going spontaneously with light sedation, uh, uh, mid as you can see the patient is spontaneously breathing and there's some oxygen concentration. And even with a very tense bipolar use, uh, this is acromioplasty, which is depend on suprascapular nerve block it's very patient. And this is after surgery. We are looking to the phrenic nerve movement. As you can see, the diaphragm is moving freely. So this isoblock can give you a wonderful anesthesia and reliable. But it's, as I said, it's only if the patient cannot tolerate intraskeline block. So as you see here, this is the liver, this is the kidney, and this white is the diaphragm. When the patient moves, the diaphragm push the liver and kidney downward. And so that's, we see that the patient have a good diaphragmatic function. Uh, the next region is the arm and elbow. Uh, the arm is supplied by muscle nerve in the front of the anteriorly and the radial nerve posteriorly. Uh, we have also the axillary nerve, which is supplied the deltoid muscle here and uh, the overlying skin and the underlying bone. So this axillary nerve is not blocked with the axillary block, so it cannot be used for upper arm surgery. The axillary block will not work for upper arm. It's suspect supplied by intercostal brachial nerve. Uh, thanks a lot, there is no surgery except just vascular uh, uh, graft is occurred in the medial side of the arm, but in most of time the surgery in the lateral side of the arm. So you don't want to block this nerve in most of time in upper lung surgery. So still in the because even side effect can be tolerated in most of the patient. However, if the patient have COPD or uh, sensitive to phrenic block, we can use infraclavicular for upper arm, and axillary still can be used for lower arm and surgery. And uh, axillary can be used, still used for lower arm and elbow. However, infraclavicular is better than axillary because less discomfort and more block and prolonged duke duration, and actually it is easier than the axillary because in the axillary you have to advance the needle for each branch. In the, in the infraclavicular, you just inject above the artery and blow the artery and that's it. So it doesn't take time. In this video, we have still one patient with COBD and we give her infraclavicular for uh, orif of the humerus. Uh, arm tourniquet. This is an important point. Uh, the arm tourniquet caused, caused by ischemic pain of the muscle of the arm, mainly the uh, anterior muscles which is supplied by the muscle cutaneous. So if you block the muscle cutaneous, you'll block the arm tourniquet. Alhamdulillah, all blocks, proximal blocks block the muscle cutaneous. Intraskeline block the muscle cutaneous. Suprascapular block the muscle cutaneous. Infraclavicular block the muscle, uh, I'm sorry. Supraclavicular block the muscle cutaneous. Infraclavicular block the muscle cutaneous. And the axillary block the muscle cutaneous. So all of them can tolerate the tourniquet. However, if you do elbow surgery, you have to block the muscle cutaneous separately if you need to apply an arm tourniquet. Uh, one good point here that if the surgeon is cooperative, you can use a forearm tourniquet. Usually forearm tourniquet can be tolerated for 40 minutes without anesthesia in most of time. But if the surgeon insists on arm tourniquet and you need to give, and you like to give the elbow block, you have to block the uh, 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 muscle cutaneous nerve separately. 
Uh, then we'll go to the forearm and wrist. The forearm is supplied by three nerves, the muscle and bone of the forearm supplied by three nerves only. The femur, uh, I'm sorry, the radial, ulnar, and median. The skin, the medial cutaneous and posterior cutaneous and lateral cutaneous supplied by medial and lateral and posterior cutaneous branches. The last two is branches of the muscle, the muscle cutaneous, which will be your block for the uh, for the tourniquet and the posterior coming from radial, you can block it in the spiral groove as I show you yesterday. But the medial cutaneous nerve, if the surgery in the medial side of the forearm, you have to block it as well. The medial cutaneous nerve, uh, I showed yesterday. The problem with the elbow block, it is the number of the uh, the number of the injections. So that's why, although the elbow block is have a fast onset and the technique is is very simple, but the number of needle insertion make it in the last choice if you do a forearm surgery. Uh, still, uh, the first choice is infraclavicular. Infraclavicular block all innervation to the forearm. Axillary still can block it, but as we said, the infraclavicular is superior to the axillary if there is no contraindication. And lastly, we'll do elbow block for forearm surgery only uh, the advantage of the elbow block is the fast onset and it keeps the movement of the shoulder and the elbow, it does not affect both. So the patient can move his hand and no need for arm sling if you use the elbow block. But the disadvantage is the number of injection which may cause some discomfort. In this surgery, we did a, f uh, and a forearm surgery with infraclavicular also. Infraclavicular really is a very good block and very successful. Lastly, the hand surgery. Uh, the hand is entirely supplied by three nerves, the median, ulnar, and radial. Uh, the skin, the muscle, the bone, everything is supplied by these three nerves. So simply, every block is enough. Uh, characteristically, that the medial side of the hand is entirely, and this is the only position in the entire body, that the skin, muscle, and bone supplied by one nerve, which is the ulnar. This is unique. You'll never find such thing in the whole body that the skin, muscle, and bone supplied by the same nerve, it's only in this little finger. So if you have a surgery in little finger, it's simply you can block the ulnar nerve alone, and it will be enough. If the surgery in the ring, in the, in the, is a surgery in the finger, you can give ring a block. It will be enough. But otherwise, you have to give the three nerves, ulnar, median, and radial. So if you have a surgery here in the hand, anywhere in the hand except in the medial side, you will give the three nerves ulnar, median, and read. And still, if you will add the arm to decay, you have to give mass cutaneous as well. In this surgery, as you see, the patient have the elbow block, and he can do uh, uh, upper arm uh, so, uh, hand surgery in very smooth way. So to summarize, the interscaline block can cover the clavicle, the shoulder, the arm, and the elbow, and it will be the first choice this, uh, the infraclavicular will be the first choice, but uh, note that interscaline does not block the ulnar side, so we cannot use it or it's not good to be used distal to the elbow. So if the surgery is distal to the elbow, if the forearm, I will prefer to use the infraclavicular block. It block all innervation of forearm. It's easy block and simple. If the surgery in the distal, in the proximal part of the hand, I prefer to give the elbow block. Elbow block give me advantage that the patient can, there is no block in the shoulder, there is no block in the elbow, the patient can use both. If the surgeon in the finger, we can give the ring block. This is the first choice. If the patient have contraindication, there is no contraindication for, I don't think there is no contraindication for ring or elbow block. If the infraclavicular is risky as in patient with bleeding tendency, I some people prefer to give the axillary. Uh, to because uh, infraclavicular is relatively deeper than the axillary, or elbow block still can be used in forearm surgery. In the arm surgery, if the patient have problem with uh, phrenic nerve uh, block, so we'll avoid the uh, interscaline, so we can use the infraclavicular for arm surgery, isoblock for hands uh, for shoulder surgery, and for clavicle, if we will not give interscaline, we should give only infiltration to minimize the risk of phrenic. However, it will be analgesic, not anesthetic. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope it uh, was clear uh, lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, uh, for the um, very good presentation. Uh, 
Uh, now, we, I think we have uh, some time for uh, just a few uh, questions and answers, please, from the uh, lecture. Uh, first, a question to Dr. Ansari, Professor Ansari, uh, about the dose adjustment of vancomycin in uh, patients with renal failure and uh, in this stage renal disease on RRT therapy. Is uh, Professor Ansari with us? Yes, yes. Uh, as you know, uh, renal, renal failure patients may be subjected to either uh, hemo, uh, traditional hemodialysis or CRT. If the patient on CRT, uh, you can, we can give 15 to 20 milligram per kg per 24 hours. If the patient, if your patient on uh, re, uh, traditional hemodialysis, you can give according, of course, to creatinine clearance. And in any patient with renal impairment, you have to monitor the creatinine, uh, monitor the vancomycin level. Mm -hmm. You have to monitor vancomycin level before every, uh, or after dose. every session, <laughs> after, after the session by four hours, and then give your dose. And to consider that any hemodialysis Every uh, two and a half or three hours dialysis will take all or will remove about 20% of vancomycin dose. And so you have to adjust the dose in your patient according to creatinine clearance. Suppose your patient accepting creatinine clearance less than 15. You have to give every, this dose 10 to 15 milligram per kg per 40 hours. Per 40 if your patient wants CRP, uh, 10 to 15 milligram every 24 hours. Uh, another question is about uh, triple therapy, triple antibiotic therapy in, uh, in ICU. Uh, they ask, is it this still uh, uh, in practice or is it obsolete now? No, I said, I, I said, no, no, we can, we can use double, we can use double uh, antibiotic therapy in cases of empirical treatment or, or in cases of severe infections. And zone, and as soon as possible, try to discalate your antibiotics to the target. Thank you so much. Thank you, the, uh, Professor Ansari. Okay. Uh, yeah. The first question to Dr. Walid. Is about the, uh, you mentioned the dose of uh, epinephrine, uh, five microgram per minute. No, no uh, epinephrine, no epinephrine, no epinephrine. No epinephrine, no epinephrine, no epinephrine. Yes, yes. yes, you said the five microgram per minute. Uh, do you titrate it according to the body weight or? Um, the dose really, or? really, uh, no epinephrine dose, we can reach to 1.5 microgram per kg. But for our patient, he was fluid responsiveness uh, because he has uh, grade one basal dysfunction, normal left atrial pressure, and the collapsing in furbina cava. Uh, for this patient, he, he needed very minimal dose, five mic per minute, because you know, we give fluid challenge and the patient improve. Uh, very, uh, we, we can give vertical five mic and uh, titrated, and we can give 0 0.5, 0 0.1 to 1.5 to 2 microgram per kg in severe sepsis. Yeah. But yeah, you can give a small dose. Uh, another question about the sedation. What about the sedation during uh, AR, uh, APRV? Uh, do you uh, this is very important question. Is uh, deep sedation or uh, no, 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 uh, light no. sedation? Ras scale, ras scale, ras scale, minus one, minus two. Great. Ras scale, minus one. Great. We don't need any muscle relaxant. We need the patient to breathe spontaneously and the calm. Once the patient is breathing without difficulty, uh, he can uh, just minus one, minus two with a small dose fentanyl, only fentanyl. It's great. Okay. We don't need too much. And this is one of important advantage for ABRP. Okay. Uh, our third question is about the what is the difference between BiPAP and the conventional APR feed. Well, really, by BAP, you will make a pillow at uh, five centimeters, and you, you will, and if you, some people make a pillow uh, five centimeter water with the BHI 30. But this is by BAP, but this is not the way at all. It's not, it is forbidden to do it nowadays. 
Nowadays, B low is zero because this was the cause of CO2 retention. We are recruited by auto beam and by volume, not by pressure. For, for uh, BiBAP to make two pressure, it is forbidden at all. We now, any center running ABRV, below is zero, no more. Uh, what's your acceptable value in, uh, in uh, APRV? Very important. Usually range 15 to 16. But the recruitment and stabilization of alveoli in ABRV more, more bet, better than B24. Yeah, to reach, to, to try to reach near the stabilization and recruit of alveoli uh, by conventional ventilation, you need beep 24. But the beep in ABRV, beep around 15. 15 centimeter over. Thank you so much, Dr. Walid. Uh, there might be more questions added after uh, after this. So if you kindly look at them and then provide the answer, we would be very grateful to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, question um, uh, to Dr. Ahmed. Yes. Um, they asking are all types of ner nerve block contraindicated if the patient is already on antiplatelets or uh, does it depend on the type or the uh, approach of the block? Uh, first, in patient with uh, uh, an, on antiplatelet, he, he will be have a bleeding in the surgery. So the surgery itself is more dangerous to the patient than my needle. So this is the first point. In most of societies, they equalize the nerve block with neuroaxial anesthesia. So usually they same, use the same protocol for coagulation as uh, doing a spinal and epidural. And actually, this is not fair. Because the point in the spinal, it is closed space, and bleeding inside will increase the pressure too much, causing ischemia of the core. But this is not the case in the peripheral nerve. In peripheral nerve, the tissues is more expandable, and so small hematoma will not cause nerve damage. Only very big hematoma can create enough pressure to damage the nerve. So first of all, if the patient can tolerate general anesthesia and it's safe to do the general anesthesia, so I consider nerve block is relative contraindication. So if the patient can tolerate general anesthesia with no risk, the patient doesn't uh, uh, have a problem with general anesthesia, okay, so general anesthesia will be enough. But most of time, the patient have ischemic heart disease and he has very vulnerable hemodynamics. So in this case, you can use nerve block if you are expert and just avoid deep blocks. Deep blocks like uh, deep lumbar block, barvertebra block, deep uh, lumbar plexus block. But in brachial plexus, it's, it's very safe. I think if you are expert, you can do it without problem. It just needle 21 or 22 gauge. So you can still need it and to avoid the complication general anesthesia. But as I told you, the problem will be the knife of the surgeon. It will cause more hematoma and more nerve damage than my needle. If you are doing the case without stopping the anti for proper time. Yeah. Um, so an another question is about the hand surgery. Which is better, uh, brachial plexus block or bear's block? No, Beer's block does not give you post-operative analgesia. analgesia. Uh, Beer's block is risk of toxicity with the problem of tourniquet. Beer's block is problem with a prolonged hand surgery. In some time of hand surgery, it may take two hours or more. So Beer's block, actually, it is it's not a block. It's just a very, very... Uh, I, I do, yani nerve block is far far, far uh, uh, quality of analgesia, both to operative and intraoperative is far better than nerve block. But unfortunately, beers, it's uh, cheaper. You just need an IV line. You don't need any equipment. You don't need nervous stimulator. You don't need ultrasound. So it's cheaper if you don't have equipment. But once you have equipment, there is no comparison. It's potentially more dangerous, yeah, if you if you're not um, they ask about the tourniquet. What if you're using the tourniquet? Uh, what kind of block would you... Uh, as I, I mentioned, that is tourniquet for tourniquet uh, pain. For usual duration, it's only due to muscle pain or muscle ischemia. And if it's within two hours, it can be covered by muscutaneous block. Any block proximal to the axillary, including axillary, will block the muscutaneous. 
if you do elbow block and tourniquet, arm tourniquet will be used, you have to add muscotine. If the surgeon is cooperative and he apply instead of arm for arm tourniquet, no need to do anything. It will be can be tolerated even without anesthesia. Thank you so much. Again, plenty of we uh, we, uh, yani we don't have much time for them, so if you can, we can answer them later for our candidates or, uh, attendees, uh, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you so much for the lovely interesting. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. That's an extremely rich uh, webinar, and thank you much for all attendees and all professors. And thank you, Dr. Adil, for guest uh, Visitor tonight and all professor Samir, Prof. Ahmed, Dr. Adil, and thank you very much for oh, our distinguished moderator tonight, Dr. Nahla Awad, and uh, everybody thank here. And uh, thank you. Thank Hopefully, you we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dara Walsh, thank you very much. Thank you.